Hello, everybody. Welcome to Profiling Evil by Mike King and Chris McDonough. It's so nice to welcome you here. We have a special guest today. I want to just call out right off the bat, Dr. Romani. And, and Dr. Romani, I, is, is it Dur Durvasula? Yeah. So it's Dr. Romani Durvasula. Durvasula. Okay. Yeah. And you can call me Dr. Romani. That's fine. That's how most people know me. Yeah. Mm hmm. That would be great. Well, thank you for being here. It is such a pleasure. Chris and I have been so excited about this opportunity. Thank you so much. I, I enjoyed our conversations, Mike. So it's, it's really a pleasure to get to talk to both you and Chris today about these topics are fascinating. Well, Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, guys. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Romani. This is uh, amazing. Uh, we're grateful that you're here. And you. uh, I know uh, I'm, I'm just on the edge of my seat waiting to get uh, to go to school. Great, great. Well, that's good. Let's see if we get an A, Chris. Let's see how you do. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, if there were an apple, he would have it for you, Doc. I love Folks, it. Yeah. Let me tell you about Dr. Romani just for a moment. She is a licensed clinical psychologist who practices in several places, Santa Monica and Sherman Oaks, California. But she's also a best-selling author. Uh, she is a professor of psychology. In fact, I think we just pulled her from the classroom to have this discussion. Yeah. And she's an international speaker. Uh, Dr. Romani, you, you've appeared on talk shows all over. Uh, the Red Table Talk, uh, Today Show, Oxygen, Investigation Discovery, and so many others. But you have this wildly popular YouTube channel, mm -hmm. Dr. Romani. And uh, that's actually because we're subscribers of it, where where we came to know you and, and reached out to you. So uh, thank you again for just being with us today. It's really exciting. We're looking forward to getting into some ideas about this architecture of a narcissistic yeah. personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. Thank you for you know being a part of my YouTube community because it's really striking to me how many people are struggling with these issues, with these personalities in their lives or just struggling to understand them. And it's so interesting. I love your channel because how you sort of, in, in your own fashion, you're a narcissism channel too, without knowing it. So I, I, um, I'm I very honored to be part of this. It's awesome. So well, we're, let's, let's jump into this. I mean, we've got, we've got, you know, We've got doc, the doctor here. You know, as they say, the doctor's in the house. Yeah, so doctor's in the house. We might as well get to what we're looking at. So we've got a couple of th three things we want to talk about. Maybe just kind of kick it off. You know, just a couple of bullet points. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is, and and doc, you can start breaking this stuff down as we go. Uh, the presumption of rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Almost all domestic violence perpetrators are potentially mm -hmm. narcissistic, mm -hmm. and then difference between a psychopath and a narcissist yeah and mm -hmm. uh what kind of breaks those down so mm -hmm. where do you think we should begin where do you want to take us uh in this adventure and uh, just kind of starting there uh, where i want to do is start from the top i just want to define terms clearly okay so let's not even assume that everyone knows what a narcissist is and then we'll sort of go into this idea of this presumption of rehabilitation or the far more simple do they ever change does this ever get better because I think that the term narcissism is so plagued by people not fully understanding it. I think the image of a narcissist is someone who likes to look in the mirror a lot and is in love with themselves, but it's far more complicated, at times even far more sinister than that. Narcissism is a sort of a whole constellation of sort of symptoms that kind of hang together, including sort of the leading ones are lack of empathy, a sense of entitlement, chronic validation and admiration seeking, grandiosity, um, there is also a, a tremendous hypersensitivity to any kind of feedback or criticism. It sometimes it's almost verges on the level of a paranoia. They can be very controlling. They need to control people, control situations. We see a lot of manipulation at the more severe end. We might see someone who's literally exploitative of other people. Uh, there can be jealousy. They, they're prone to lie. They deny other people's reality. And what's so interesting is all of this stuff that's very toxic and very problematic is all hanging around an inner core structure that's deeply insecure. And that insecurity is the core of this lashing out. In many ways, if you were that insecure, you would need a suit of armor around you through grandiosity and entitlement and all this other stuff. So that's what narcissism is. And people who are narcissistic are also 
They're very prone to conflict. They're very vindictive. They are very antagonistic. Um, they're very dysregulated. They will snap very quickly and they become very rageful. So there's an unpredictability to them. And so they people are scared of them at times. But yet, in the same breath, they're very charming. They're very charismatic and they're very confident. And that's what draws people in in the first place. So this is it's a much more nuanced pattern than somebody that just likes to look at themselves in the mirror. Interesting. You, you know, I, I feel like we're looking at just in this description that you've given at almost every serious serial mm -hmm. uh, predator that mm -hmm. we have dealt with in our careers. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, are there differing levels of mm -hmm. narcissism functioning and yeah. non-functioning or how does that work? So narcissism exists on a continuum, okay? So I'd almost say at its most, you know, at the almost the more subclinical, less problematic levels, you really are talking about the person who's a bit superficial and social media obsessed and, you know, always con concerned with appearances and not very sensitive and only talk about themselves. Like that's sort of your kind of baseline narcissist. And th maybe they're just sort of an annoyance. And that's definitely not someone you'd go to with your deepest, darkest secrets and recognize they're always going to hijack the conversation. But as we go to the more severe end of the continuum, we end up in what I, is, I and many others would call malignant narcissism. Malignant narcissism actually in some ways has a lot of the feel of a psychopathy. These are people who are more manipulative. They're more exploitative. There's a greater menace to them. They very much need to control people, control situations. So there is a, um, there, there's almost this sense of danger there. And I would say some of the stories you profile, if anything, they have more of that malignant narcissistic feel. And then along the way, we see other patterns that you may also see in some of the perpetrators you talk about. One of them is called covert narcissism. Covert narcissism is a pattern that people who do the theory and research in this field have highlighted as we're so used to the narcissist as being, look at me, I'm so great, like very salesperson-y and very performy. But there's a whole relatively large subgroup of narcissists that are often, they, they always have a chronic sense of victimization. They're resentful and they're sullen and they're angry and they're brooding. And they're definitely not that sort of look at me, show person kind of feel. They're, they're, there is something almost they always feel like they're going to snap. And some people meet them, they almost feel like they want to rescue them. They feel sorry for them because these covert narcissistic types sell their story as sort of a sad sack story. Like I would have been one of the great ones, but the world never caught me a break. And they always walk around in this victimized stance. And in that way, that sullenness and that resentfulness can sometimes pop out at a rate as a rage. And these folks can be quite dangerous. And so, you know, as you can see, not only is there a continuum, but there's also these subtypes. I'm, I'm already, I'm, I'm, you're, I'm hooked. <laughs> uh, be hooked, but don't have these people as your friends. That's all I got. <laughs> You've got me. Yeah, and I, and I hope as we talk that we'll, we'll maybe cover that idea of, of if you have uh, somehow made the kinds of mistakes that make these people your friends, how do you either get away? Because I would suspect, and maybe this is the way to introduce the, the very first topic, can they be rehabilitated mm -hmm. into a human being that you enjoy being right. around? So here's the tricky piece. What we know in general about narcissism is that it's a pattern that's not very amenable to change. And here's the reason for that. People who are narcissistic lack what we call self-reflective capacity. That's a fancy way of saying that they have no insight into how they affect other people, nor do they care. They are so focused on their image, looking good to the world and regulating sort of their insecurity that they just don't, they did never stop to think about how am I affecting somebody else. And because of that, they're not going to be motivated to change because frankly, in most cases, they don't think they're the ones who need, need to change. They blame everyone else. This is your fault. This is your fault. She needs to change. She needs to do it differently. And by blaming everyone, they never take responsibility. So if you don't take responsibility, where's the driver for change in that? That's a big issue. So Could, where, where does that, where does the ground level start uh, in that type of, uh, you know, that uh, I guess you would call it a symptomology, right? Of some sort that they're projecting constantly outward, but where does it start internally? Do, 
uh, with an individual, meaning, you know, if they're not able to see the damage that they're doing and they're not, and they're not really caring about the damage that they're doing, how do they get to that level? Or is it a process that they get to or, or, or are they born that way? I mean, I guess that's kind of a crazy question, but how does so a person get there? How does the person become narcissistic? So I want to answer yeah. Mike's question. I want to come back to what you're asking sure. me, Chris, because they're related but a little different. Because to Mike's question, can they change? In an infinitesimal number of cases, do we see significant clinical change of any kind in somebody who's narcissistic? And even in those cases, once that narcissistic person is forced to face frustration or disappointment or stress, even if they've made some change, they tend to snap back to their baseline. We know that narcissistic individuals are almost 60% more likely to drop out of therapy. As soon as the therapist turns up the heat and really tries to make them do real work, they're out. Um, therapists get burned out. They, they're, they're not able to do the long-term work with them. And I will tell you, I've worked with more than a small share of narcissistic clients. I think I'm a pretty decent therapist. I've made only minimal, and I say minimal progress in these cases. In fact, the strongest progress I've made is I've created a somewhat trusting relationship with them and I've gotten them to the point where they apologize for not showing up to a session, but then getting angry that they can't just get whatever time that works for them. So there's that sense of like, now they say sorry, but they still do it. So if you're in a relationship with someone like that, is that something you want to do? Oh, I cheated on you again, honey. Sorry. Oh, but I'm just going to do it again. So apology holds no value. And so by and large, we see, I, I would say in the macro, we see almost no change in the narcissistic personality. And frankly, because of the number of enablers out there in the world, there's little incentive for them to change. As a rule, narcissists make more money. They tend to be more successful. And so we are a society that's sort of almost incentivized narcissism. Where's the, where's the incentive to change? And how many people stay with the narcissist just because they wow. provide those other things like a nice lifestyle or more income or other things? You know, Mike, if we took, focus this on intimate relationships, you know, like, you know, spouses or partners, fiancés, whatever, I'm thinking 50% stay. Half. This is not Amazing. like there's in the 90% of people are running out the door. And for a lot of the reasons you bring up, in fact, my second book was called, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Surviving yeah, a Relationship. I was just reading that. I was just oh, reading Thank you, Chris. Go ahead. Go ahead. And that <laughs> title was intentional because I thought to say, run away from the narcissist would be a very irresponsible book because I saw 50% of people were staying. And at a minimum, I wanted to prepare people for that. And there's lots of reasons people stay. And I am in no position to judge that. I don't know their lives. I don't walk their path. It could be money. It can be culture. It can be religion. It can be having small children. It could be fear. You know, there, and all of those are perfectly fine reasons. Now, I will tell you, once you read the should I stay part of the book, you're saying there's no relationship here. Because the one thing I dismantle is I dismantle hope. I'm like, I am not going to let you stay in this relationship thinking it's going to get better. You can stay in yeah. this relationship knowing exactly what it is. And for some people are saying, all right, if that's the deal, then maybe I will leave. But I still think it's half-half. <laughs> and, and, you know, if this was your loved one, your, mm -hmm. your counsel would be for them to flee from that. And yeah. yet fleeing is fraught with challenge. You know, all of a sudden you have no income. You're in uh, low income housing and you're trying to find a job. Or maybe it's a spouse who uh, fell in love with someone that's charismatic like that. But now they're, because they didn't go to college or other things, they're right. working minimum wage jobs. Mm -hmm. I mean, holy cow, it's a, it's a terrible cycle, but it has to be broken because it won't get better, will it? It, it won't. And here's a, a big part of the problem, Mike. And this is a wake up call. Our court systems are unwilling to recognize this pattern. So what that means is that when a person is divorcing a narcissistic partner, the narcissistic partner is in a much better position to leverage the legal system to their advantage. They're more able to play the games one needs to play. And if you ever say the word narcissist in family court, you are immediately labeled the difficult parent. So it's very strategic. And a lot of people have made that mistake thinking, oh, the judge and the court is going to see what a narcissist this person is and every, oh, heck no. 
I have seen many people who have endured tremendous suffering in a narcissistic relationship. Then they go, they they are pre proceeding through a divorce. They use that word narcissistic, and they find themselves actually getting less custody of their kids than they expected because they're the more problematic parent. So we have a court system that doesn't want to recognize this. They're saying, "Oh well, it's the end of a marriage, and people aren't going to get along." And I'm like, "This isn't about people getting along. This is about a, a genuinely pathological." Yeah, doc, we lost your audio there. Oh wait, um, you want me to try again? Oh. Is that better, or is that still a problem? Maybe it was mine. Sorry about that. It must be mine, Doc, because I can hear I, you on the speaker. You're now. fine, Doctor Romani. Okay, great. Thank you. You're Tyler. fine. Okay, yes. thanks. Okay. Okay. So, so, but when it comes down to it, though, it's this, this, because the courts don't get it, because a lot of family members don't get it. I was recently working with a woman who had been in a forty-year marriage with a narcissist. And when she tried to talk to her own friends, and these are educated, smart people, and she said, I had to get out, you know, this was a case of narcissistic abuse. Her friends looked at her and said, what? What are you saying? As though, and I mean, they were, they almost were gaslighting her. They were, you know, they were saying, what are you talking about? That's not even a thing. And until this becomes recognized as a thing, and this has to be recognized as a thing by the courts, by domestic violence programs, by yeah. law enforcement, by custody evaluators, by lawyers, people need to see this as a thing so that better decisions can be made. And honestly, what we need to be doing is teaching people before they ever get into a relationship to look for the red flags. Yeah, that's a very, that is, that's critical. I mean, we've you know, I spent some time obviously in domestic violence, you know, in a DV unit where, you know, you just see the cycle yep. and, and to, I think where you're going and, and I totally agree with you 100%. I mean, the, these poor folks are just, they feel trapped. Uh, they're looking for that empathy to get out of it somehow, yes. but they just keep going it back into the cycle as a whole that you're talking about. And, and you're right. You go to court and the first person that says boo, the, the, the court says, ah, well, there's the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, 100%. So, so it goes back to Mike's point, though, this idea of rehabilitation, because one of the biggest issues, and this has become a real controversy in the world of domestic violence and, and intimate partner violence, is that there's always been a reluctance to label this pattern as narcissism. And, he, and part of it was thoughtful, but not thoughtful. And by this, I mean this, the idea of narcissism being treated as a mental illness, it's not. Narcissistic personality disorder is a mental illness. And honestly, the rates of that in the population-based studies is about one to 5%, maybe three to 6%, okay? It's very small. Narcissism is more prevalent. Narcissism is not a mental illness. It's a difficult maladaptive personality style, but it's not a mental illness. But a lot of domestic violence programs were loath to name someone as narcissistic because they viewed it as a clinical condition that it could potentially get improved. And so the advocates were saying, we don't want to go there because we don't want people to think that ah, there's, there's an opportunity for change. My point is that this pattern is not amenable to change, but by naming it, and recognizing how not amenable to change this is, then we've identified something and we've identified a pattern that actually gives the survivor of domestic violence something to understand. It also allows the advocates, law enforcement to see what they're dealing with and come up with better policies. This has got to go all the way up to the lawmakers where we need better rules around restraining orders and protective orders and all of that. Because once you understand narcissism, you realize that the protections we have in place aren't sufficient. Yeah, it's almost like we haven't done the paradigm shift from mm -hmm. the old, uh, you know, the, uh, what is it, battered women's syndrome, right? right. As I used right. to, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, no, we need to, we need to repackage this to what it is mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. take a, a, a broader yeah. look at it. Interesting. I'm really, I'm really troubled by um, the innocent victims at the bottom of the rung here, the children that yeah. get to witness all of this. What, are there statistics or studies that would back up, um, an, uh, I don't know, a, an opinion doc about uh, if a child is witnessing this, will they then seek out a companion that does the same kinds of behaviors? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. There is a, when a child has a narcissistic or high conflict parent, they're much more vulnerable 
to choosing those characteristics in a future partner, especially if they haven't had the opportunity to, the, to do the psychological unpacking and the psychological work. Part of this gets termed something called trauma bonding. The child who has a narcissistic, invalidating, or abusive parent at er an early age, because remember, the child is never going to call the parent out. The child is always going to assume it's something wrong with them, or whatever this thing is with their parent, this is love. And that equation of, of abuse, invalidation, confusion, chaos, and a feeling of worthlessness with love, that trauma-bonded relationship, then can waft into adulthood. And in fact, when those conditions are present, there's a person who might say, okay, there's a familiarity here and may, be, may fall into something all the while knowing this doesn't feel good, but they almost feel stuck because they haven't had the opportunity to do the legacy work to unpack it. And we don't talk about this enough. Now, various therapeutic models have talk about it, talked about it. It's called repetition compulsion by Freudian analysts. You know, it's called observational learning by the behaviorists. It's like we do what we've seen. And, and but there's something that almost gets normalized by an, about an invalidating relationship when you grow up like this. And when you've had a narcissistic parent or parent, you can end up spending a, your entire childhood trying to earn love and trying to prove yourself. Now fast forward 20 years, you're in a relationship and all you're doing is jumping through hoops to impress your partner the same way you did that with your parent. And if you're not jumping through hoops, it's not love. That's interesting. So it really is a learned behavior and it keeps progressing itself. The uh, choosing, to, well, to, yes. to a familiar to a familiarity. Is yes. What you're saying. It can yeah. be learned. I also think, but I'm going to hold to this. I think okay. it's people not knowing. Yeah. I have to tell okay. you the number of clients I've worked with where we did very quick psychoeducational work, like this is what this pattern is. This is what it looks like. They're saying, oh my gosh, you just described my parents. You described my childhood. You described my life. Now I see it. And in pretty short order, they start making choices and decisions that will either get them out or help them set boundaries. We are so accustomed when we're working with a survivor of narcissistic abuse or even domestic abuse to pathologize the survivor. She's the battered woman. She's depressed. She's anxious. Instead of looking at the issues inherent in the perpetrator. And as long as we pathologize the person in the room, the person going through narcissistic abuse, we miss the opportunity to educate them. And they say, oh, I got it. I got it. Absolutely. Call an attorney tomorrow. That's a different game. Give me the opportunity to educate these clients first before you assume that they're absolutely helpless and not able to defend themselves. People need this information. They're not getting it. Yeah, that's fascinating. I remember reading uh, uh, Man's Search Remaining with Viktor Frankl mm -hmm. and his, his observations in the logotherapy in relationship to his experiences in, in the concentration camps and stuff and how, you know, he it was actually the individual's that would be more enabling towards the more most abusive behavior when they got out uh, after the experience if they survived uh, they had a more difficult time trying to, <laughs> to move forward it, is some of your research that you've done i mean uh, can you educate us a little bit about you know what you've done looking you know forward into where we are today i'm, I'm just fascinated by your background number one but Number two, what, where, where did you start in your foundation in relationship to, to getting here? So it's interesting you ask that because I have to tell you, I went to a absolute, I went to UCLA, which is one of the best graduate programs in the country. I trained at some of the best clinical training sites and had the best supervision. I was blessed beyond belief to have the training experiences I had. The word narcissism didn't come up once in the eight years of training I did. Oh, not, interesting. Not oh. once. Okay. Interesting. Not <laughs> once. We did not have a course on personality disorders. We did not talk about person. When we talked about personality, we never talked about narcissism. It is a huge blind spot in the field of mental health. Part of it is because nobody wants to take on the narcissist, right? They, they don't get better. So it's like a losing bet. And it's a frustrating group that some people will literally refuse to work with narcissistic clients, okay? Which I think is a huge crisis in mental health because the only way you can help the survivors is by working with the narcissist themselves. Yeah. It was there 
that I learned the dynamics of this personality. So I'm like, ah, I see, I'm beginning to get it. And even when you do make a therapeutic alliance and attachment with them, they still are vindictive. They still can't tolerate that kind of trust or closeness. I was able to see it firsthand, but where I actually got interested in it initially was through research. I was, um, we were doing clinical research in the community and we were noticing that some of the clients really made life miserable for the receptionists and the nurses and the assistants in the clinic. And I'm thinking this one small group of patients is actually taking up like 80% of the resources in this clinic. Wow. And that gave birth to a series of studies that were funded by the National Institutes of Health, where we were trying to look at personality styles and how they were associated with various kinds of health behaviors and decision-making. But at the same time, I also was working with more and more clients who kept bringing in the same story, which was these relationships where they were invalidated and confused and minimized and dismissed and devalued. And it was happening over and over. And I started writing these emails. Like we, I, they'd say after the session, I'm so confused. I can't even remember what you said. I said, I have my notes. I'll type them up. And I noticed that I kept sending the same email. And that those emails were what slowly began the foundation of a book on this topic. And then I thought, and then I kept looking in the literature at nothing. I was coming up with bupkis, nothing. Nobody was talking about this. And then I thought, okay, this, and then I got mad at the mental health profession because you know what a lot of people will say, let's say somebody's being gaslighted. Their reality is intentionally being confused or denied. Right. You know what They're some, them up. Yeah, you know what some psychologists will say? We have no right to interpret their motivations. Maybe they have a reason for that. Let's understand that. My reason for that, that's abuse. They are denying someone's reality. I'll say, well, maybe they have a history of trauma. And I said, you know what? If this person, this narcissistic person has a history of trauma as a clinician, my heart hurts for them and I want them to get the help they need. It yeah. does not give them the right to turn another human being into their punching bag. That is not acceptable. I yeah, don't care amen. about their backstory. Yeah. No, I, I, you, again, I, uh, you know, I'm on, I'm, I'm on your team 100%. Mike, so doctor, you have you been able to influence academia then with this idea of narcissism not being taught at the university level with what you're doing at UCLA? Well, I'm at, I'm actually at California State University, Los Angeles. Oh, like yeah, Los Angeles, that's State right. LA, but I've been a professor at Cal State LA. I actually, I had the good fortune of being chosen as one of the keynote speakers at the annual convention of the American Psychological Association this past August. And so that showed me at least some level of readiness that people, this is largely an organization of therapists, to give a platform to this kind of a conversation. I'll be doing a therapist training in March and I'm actually now developing a company where I'm trying to start training therapists on how to do this work. So I am not going to bring the academy over that quickly, though we are seeing, while we're seeing more and more published research on narcissism, a lot of it gets at things like how to measure it, how it associates with other kinds of behaviors, sometimes like, um, like uh, social media use. And I actually just recently um, at the conference um, on crimes against women, I, I spoke at, at their virtual conference on domestic violence. And my team and I were struck by how little literature there was in the domestic violence field, academic literature on, on narcissism. And then I only was able to find one article, one article on narcissistic abuse in the literature. And that was written by a nursing professor. So it is, this is going to be a slow burn, but if I wait for academia to give me full buy-in, I'm going to be dead. So in the interim, I am <laughs> going to start teaching therapists. That's amazing, folks. We're talking with Dr. Romani, a, a licensed clinical psychologist. And I, um, I'm wondering, Doc, could you, could you share the books that you've written and yeah, just kind of an overview of what each book is about, especially um, I, 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 the surviving a relationship with a narcissist and should I stay, should I go? Mm -hmm. So my, my second, my first book was on sort of health and wellness overall, but my second book was called, should I stay or should I go surviving a relationship with a narcissist? And that book, like I said, was all these emails I was writing. I ended up turning it into a book because I was thinking, I want, I want people to read about this so they can make a decision that's good for them. 
after that book came out, I got many, many emails and, and, you know, people reaching out saying, love this book, but it's actually my mom who's the narcissist or my dad. It's my boss. It's my brother. It's my sister. It's my best friend. It's my adult child. I'm like, ah, these are slightly different relationships. You don't choose your mom or dad. You don't choose your siblings. You know, you may need to keep that boss around to eat and on and on and on. I thought this is a, this is a far more multifaceted story than I thought. And then some things happened in the political landscape of this country in 2016 that led the conversation about narcissism to blow up. Now, even your aunt at Thanksgiving dinner was using the word narcissism and up till then, nobody was talking about it. So I, said, <laughs> ah. so I contacted my publisher and he was very kind. I, and he's like, you wanna write a book, write another book. And so, and it was called, Don't You Know Who I Am? how to stay sane in an era of narcissism, entitlement, and incivility. And I called it, don't you know who I am? Because that's what narcissists say all the time. They say it to the poor person working at the grocery store. They say it to the person at the coffee shop. Don't you know who I am? No, I actually don't, nor do I care really. But, <laughs> but the, the, then it was, there was sort of three things happening in that book. One was to give a more robust overview and tie it to our current political and global landscape. Two was to walk people through the landscapes of all of these different relationships, not just partners, but like I said, bosses and siblings and adult children, and most importantly, parents. And then finally, to give people a more detailed plan for healing. And so, and in fact, as I'm, I'm doing some editorial work as we go into the revision, I'm gonna put in a section obviously about the pandemic because that also opened our eyes a bit to some of these patterns, you know? And so th that's what these books do. It's really to help people say, no, it's not you. You're not losing your mind. This is really happening. But a lot of therapists won't talk about narcissism. So the poor client is often left wondering like, Am I losing my mind because all we do is keep talking about my depression, but then I keep going home to this person I'm married to and they keep twisting my reality and they go back and the therapist keeps talking about their depression and instead of just calling the partner out. That is really interesting. I, as you were talking, I was thinking about our demographic that, that watches Profiling Evil, mm -hmm. primarily uh, women. And uh, it's, it's interesting to us because- Intelligent uh, women. Mm -hmm. Very intelligent, very intelligent. And, and frankly, it is it is interesting because it's it's uh, an educated group, but it's but it's interesting because many men want cops, i.e., Chris and me, to be the guy with the smoke swirling around our head that's throwing cuss words out and oh. saying we're going to book them, Dano, and and uh, and, and um, we we take a little different tact where we don't believe that that's necessary to be that crass mm -hmm. and and uh, and demeaning at times. But it's interesting how people respond to those kinds of things. And I wonder, given the way things have kind of become, can we become a kinder, more civil people again? You know, Mike, I, I don't know. I'm going to be honest with you. I wish I could give you the warm fuzzies and the unicorns and the rainbows here. But I, at this <laughs> point, I don't know. I feel as though what would have to happen, I mean, listen, we've just been through something as catastrophic as I've ever known and hopefully ever will know in my lifetime. And it, it, if anything, it's divided us further. So if that's the verdict, uh, one thing that has, here's the thing, given that the core of narcissism is insecurity, instead of trying to force people to be nice to each other, can we find a way to alleviate that insecurity? Because yeah. that's really what's underlying everyone attacking each other. And there's all kinds of sociological things we could get into that might be sort of beyond the scope of this, but it's, you know, we see these huge income disparities. We see, um, you know, we see all kinds of social issues that have come up where people are, again, it plays upon that sense of insecurity, people feeling like they're working hard and getting nowhere. All of that builds on insecurity. And I think that the fact is, even our educational systems are always like, this is what the child doesn't know. This is what the child is getting wrong. This is what the child is not doing right in school. Instead of really building into school a hugely strong social developmental curriculum that focuses on building a sense yeah. of security, a sense of self, a sense of self-worth. And a lot of people say, well, maybe that should be the job of the parents. Well, clearly the parents are dropping the ball. So if, if the schools have to be the ones to do it, then let the schools at least give it a shot Shot. But the problem is that kid still goes home. And if they're dealing with a narcissistic, invalidating, or otherwise abusive parent, that's a really, really hard thing to push back on because that's honestly where kids do develop that sense of self and sense of safety in the world. 
if I had one thing I wish we could do is, is to address that sense of safety kids have in the world, to keep them safe, to not let them be exposed to trauma, to help them feel lifted up, unconditionally supported. You do that, I'm going to be out of business. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a nice way to retire? Oh, it would be great. I would happily work as a, in a coffee shop somewhere for the rest of my days, looking at all these kind and civil people coming in and being kind. I would love that. It's just not going to happen. And yeah. so we are going to have to adjust to this and figure out, as I, I, write, I write about this in my work, I tell people, tend to your own garden. If you waste your time trying to get everyone else to be a civil human being, you're going to you're going to completely feel helpless. But tend to your own garden. You do you. You be kind to every person in your purview, every clerk, every fellow driver, everyone you encounter. And if enough of us did this, maybe we'll create critical mass. Are there still going to be those toxic, entitled people at the gates? You better believe it. They ain't going anywhere. But it's also about recognizing that it is not your responsibility to change them. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you 100%. I mean, we, you know, when, when I started in the in law enforcement, I mean, it was literally, uh, this was more powerful than this. And mm -hmm. it seems like we've had a paradigm shift uh, with, you know, civility as a whole. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we used to be able to, you know, we would talk to people for hours Mm -hmm. uh, and say, you know, is there anything else I can say or do to, you know, ask mm -hmm. you to please get into this car? You know, I, I can't control it, i.e. you've done something wrong. I have no other option. But it seems like there's this, you know, um, I don't I don't even know what to call it anymore. If there's this impulse to react uh, about reaction. And and I, I think social media has played a, a real critical role. Uh, in in desensitizing us uh, in relationship to thinking through problems versus beating through them. What, what's your thought on that? I agree we have become a very reactive world on all sides of, uh, on all sides, like on all sides, for all people have become more reactive. Yeah. And I think that there's, a lot of this does go back to this idea of entitlement, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that the world is shifting and power balances are shifting and people don't like giving up their power. And I think that sure. that's also resulted in a lot of this, people not liking those shifts and holding on for dear life. And thus this entitlement and people sort of almost feeling that they have to protect their corner of the world. I think what technology has done is it's made everything happen very quickly. So we don't think we can press send and now we've sent the angry email. We've sent the angry text. It used to be if you wanted to make your words known in a newspaper, you had to find a piece of paper and write a letter and find a stamp and find an envelope. By the time you did all that, you might have cooled down. And then there was an editor on the other side that could make decisions on what was appropriate to be published. And it wouldn't be some horrible, cruel rant, but this idea of the internet troll who says anything they want in the most cruel possible way and is abusive. Yeah. And you see that you see people affected by, by this across the spectrum is that it's horrifying what people are simply putting an opinion out there is open season for people to be absolutely cruel and dismissive and horrifying yeah. in their words. Then when we go back to that issue of insecurity I was bringing up, social media is a tool for doubling down on insecurity, because all it does is tell you what you don't have, what you don't do, where you're not at, you know, someone's better off, someone's this, I mean, we're not teaching young people to think sufficiently critically about it. And I think that there are people out there who are more vulnerable. I think there's a lot of kids out there. I'm struck by the savvy of teenagers and emerging adults are like, well, I know, I know that photo is Photoshop. <laughs> I know that. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's also a critical mass of young people out there who are vulnerable, who may have endured trauma or yeah. abuse, who are growing up in unsafe environments, who may yeah. have a propensity to mental illness. Those kids who are now witnessing social media are the ones who may be more um, vulnerable to its effects. Mm -hmm. And they're a vulnerable group. And that's a lot of people who see the social media. And I think everybody, mothers, fathers, everyone out there, kids are all really, really bristling under, am I doing it right? So everyone's in security stays. You know, I remember a study. Uh, I, I have a saying that Facebook has two faces. Uh, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah. the, 
the I, I remember a study the feds did years ago. It was called Gangs 2000. Mm -hmm. And it was a DOJ uh, study. And what they did is they went around to all the inner cities, uh, the FBI did, and a variety of uh, folks. And if I remember the context of the study essentially was they, they went through a list of PTSD symptomology. Uh, and then they went around the world and they overlaid the data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this was, um, um, it was the AG's office in California, because I did my time in Southern California there near you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but they overlaid the data. And what they found was the juvenile court system wasn't prepared. And this is during the time when they were, uh, the courts were deciding whether or not to extend the age of accountability. Remember, it used mm -hmm. to be 12 years old. Yes. Right. And so there were a lot of more crimes of juveniles. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the courts were kind of like, you know, we need to look at this. So the legislator said, well, let's study this. And, and what they found was when they overlaid that data is they discovered that the kids in the inner cities of the United States were suffering the same symptomology of PTSD mm -hmm. that city that kids in war torn lands were Correct. suffering. Were, Correct. Were suffering. Yes. Are we seeing the fruits of that as well as some of the foundation of to where what you've been researching and studying where we are today? Or am I off base here? Well, I think that what has happened is that, you know, what we've done a terrible job of is protecting kids and children in certain communities were far less protected. They were exposed to community violence. There was a lack of mental health resources in those communities. There was a there was um, less support in the face of exposure to alcohol and drugs. There was poor education systems. I mean, I think all of that has kept those children in more unsafe spaces. Trauma is trauma. OK, the issue then becomes how much a person can quickly get help for that, feel supported, be put into a place of safety. So whether it's a war or whether it's the, the community violence that's happening where somebody lives, we have horribly. No, we've completely not responded to that properly. And so we are seeing some of that, but it's much more than that. We can't make this just about kids who are growing up under those conditions. We're seeing narcissism in rural communities. We are seeing narcissism in big cities. We see narcissism in the wealthy. We see narcissism in the impoverished. A lot of people think of narcissism as this, ah, this is just sort of the gilded person who's living in there. No, not at all. And I think it's the there's a sort of a universality to it. And what's interesting is you're asking me, you're saying they had this overlay, the DOJ study did this overlay of all these different places talking about PTSD. It is my hope to do that kind of study with narcissism because it's not even being talked about in other parts of the world. And in fact, it's almost culturally normalized in other parts of the world, especially parts of the world that are more authoritarian and yeah. patriarchal, where it's like, one person gets to say what goes, even in a family system, that is a bleeding ground for narcissism and a repetition of these cycles. We also tend to see narcissism is more endemic in societies where there's more violence against women and that violence is sanctioned. Yeah, no, I I, I totally get where you're going. I love it. Absolutely. And it's a, it's a necessary study. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're in the United States alone. I mean, the, obviously the violent crime in this country is just, you know, just staggering. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if people really realized, you know, and I used to use a statistic in class and remember, remember Mike, we would, I, I would write up on the board 58,000 times 10. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I would ask the class and this was, you know, seasoned homicide investigators and they would ask the, you know, what is that? And I'd say, well, this is how many uh, troops we lost in Vietnam in a 10 year war. And then I would put 23,000 times 10. And I'd say, what is this number? And most of them didn't know. And I'd say, this is DOJ and FBI statistics on how many Americans are killed every year for 10 years. And then I total them up, 53,233,000. Mm -hmm. And then I would start the class by turning and saying, where's the war? Right. And, and so this idea, what you're presenting here, I think, you know, gangs and, you know, those become narcissistic personality uh, draws, don't they? Because they're trying to prove something uh, to the community. And then simultaneously, we have this, you know, this authoritarian situation taking place mm -hmm. in, in home environments. And I, I, 
I don't know. I don't, I don't know if there, if there's a correlation and, and by the way, I don't want to keep going off into a tangent. Stop me anytime. My wife would. Well, well you know, it's, I think it's, <laughs> what's, what's so tough is a gang, like any social structure is what we'd call variegated. It's not as simple that a gang is comprised of a bunch of narcissistic people. It's quite possible that at the, at the higher levels of the gang or the people who have more power and control in that gang, you see more narcissistic personality styles because they are driven more by grandiosity and entitlement, all of that. But within that gang, maybe people who are not at all narcissistic, but are looking for structure, for safety, for comfort, empathy. and for belonging, and potentially even empathy. But this goes to something else that Mike, and I, maybe I'm, I'm going to jump ahead to something else Mike had brought up, which is this idea of psychopathy. And I would say that on a channel like Profiling Evil, you got to talk about psychopathy, because it's a different construct than narcissism. And while there's very, very shared top notes, um, the grandiosity, the entitlement, the rage, the manipulation, the control, they're very different creatures. One of the key differences, the narcissists are insecure. They really are. This very much is, I got to look good. I got everyone's got to like me and I got to be that person. The psychopath doesn't care. They, you know, they, they will get, people will like them because they're terrified of them. So they may just go along to get along kind of thing. But the, the psychopath is calculated. They're cunning. They're calm. They're cool. You know this from doing this kind of work. It's a yeah. very different beast. So I would say when we even look at domestic violence perpetrators, for example, a goodly chunk of them are psychopathic. Probably many more are narcissistic because that's more common. Psychopathy is a very, very different kind of a pattern. It really speaks to very different kinds of central nervous system patterns and autonomic nervous system patterns. We all see that people who are psychopathic, they, they're, they're stress tolerant. They don't experience anxiety the same way, which is why they can engage in repeated criminality without almost benefiting from experience. And most of us don't like that feeling of being so autonomically aroused that we're, we're so tense and anxious. They don't experience that in the same way. So perpetrating violence and all that is easier. But also when we look at the psychopath's motivations, it's very, very clear, power, pleasure, profit. That's it. Yeah. There's nothing to do with intimacy, nothing to do with empathy. And they will, again, so the exploitativeness in this particular pattern is very high. Finally, the true psychopath, when we look at the original con theoretical conceptions of psychopathy, we look at the work of people like Hare, we look at the work by Cleckley, we look at Reed Malloy's more recent work, we come down to that lack of remorse. You know, and that lack of remorse, like n having no problem and feeling, and they can they can trick judges and they can trick cops and they can trick yeah. everyone. The narcissists aren't quite that crafty. They they do not have they their insecurity sometimes gets in the way. They definitely feel remorse, and the narcissist experiences the remorse as shame. And that shame is a key dynamic in narcissism. It's something that's come up in the domestic violence literature. And the key to understanding the shame and the narcissist and violence is that all narcissists are afraid that somebody's going to see their deficits. Whereas I have no problem with you seeing my deficits, my right. messy room, my messy life. Like it's fine. Like I'm fine with that as I'm sure I'm hoping and sure that you are too. Narcissists cannot let those deficits be seen. And the minute one of those deficits percolates up and other people see one of their deficits and somebody brings it to attention. So maybe somebody makes fun of them or laughs at them or says, you never worked there or criticizes them. The narcissist will, number one, get angry at the person who pointed out their shortcoming, which is great because it deflects the energy off of them onto the person who did that to them. But then the narcissist, once their shame gets activated, they feel a lot of rage, again, usually at the person who called them out. Then they feel more shame for looking so disorganized to get so rageful. And then they feel more shame. And that shame rage cycle has been highlighted as one of the key cycles in domestic violence because there is some there is something societally that's shameful thank goodness about knowing that you've you have you've abused someone who may have less power than you or that you you were allegedly love so that cycle is a big piece of this that shame rage cycle but there's also a lot of literature out there that documents that narcissists are more likely to engage in aggressive behavior in violent behavior interestingly narcissists are also most more likely to be very dangerously aggressive drivers so the research on narcissism and aggression and violence has also been borne out 
my mind is going a thousand miles an yeah. hour, Doc. Yeah. Um, power, pleasure, and profit. profit. Now, um, when when we have looked from a profiling perspective at uh, we we call it suspectology or the study of these suspects and, and their backgrounds, having that simple breakdown um, in that, uh, and it, would it be fair to say uh, with the narcissist, it's uh, how do I appear that is the triggering mm -hmm. event? Mm -hmm. How do I appear? Everything is how do I appear, which is why many people in narcissistic relationships will say, I feel like I'm with a Jekyll Hyde situation in public. He's so like, he, he talks about me great and presents me great and everything's great. And then as soon as we're in the car on the ride home or we're home, it is nothing. Wrong. Why did you talk to that guy for so long? And then the rage and then potentially the entire cycle of violence begins. But it's the two-facedness because it's so important for the narcissist to look good to the world. That's a hallmark and confuses the heck out of the people in those relationships. Well, this is really cool because part of our strategy in an interview, obviously, is to understand what's motivating that offender and the way they're doing things. Mm -hmm. And you have just given us some tools that would really help law enforcement to think about as they prepare their interview strategy and talking about these different personality types to not spend time wasted in looking at some kinds of behaviors when you're dealing with a narcissist versus a psychopath. Right. Well, because first of all, the psychopath is a brilliant liar. I mean, a person would have to be a genius questioner to work with a psychopath. They are so masterful at lying. And because they don't have that autonomic nervous system boiling up, like when I lie, my heart's racing. I can't lie, right? It's just not, it, it, I don't, I have a different kind of autonomic nervous system than a psychopath. But because they don't feel that, they can lie to your face with such a smoothness that they can actually quite honestly outwit a lie detector test because what, how do lie detector tests work? They're based on autonomic nervous system reactivity, even at the most subtle levels. Well, they don't have that. So it's, it, they, it is very difficult to question them. They are 20 steps ahead. They, and unlike a narcissist, a narcissist would be a little bit more messy on questioning because they're insecure and they're terrified of getting caught out. I think psychopaths actually built getting caught out into the model. They're like, well, I got caught on that one. They do the time, they come back out and they start again. Oh, and uh, I think Chris would, would back me up on this. I mean, interviewing a psychopath is such a challenge mm -hmm. and it's almost entertaining for the psychopath to just oh, yes. allow you to try to, to get something out of them. And if you're not walking in so prepared and having so much information and intelligence, not, not personal intelligence, but intel on the person uh, before you walk into that interview, they're almost always guaranteed to fail from an interview perspective. But this idea of, of just um, determ determining whether what the personality type is first could really help law enforcement. And I assume it could help all of us as just individuals in our interactions with people like that, couldn't it? Uh, well, I think that what I tell people is that, you know, by and large, many of us will mercifully not interact with psychopaths, but they hide in plain sight. You'd be amazed at how many psychopaths are in professions you'd never dream of. Not every psychopath is like a, you know, a, a like a, a king, drug kingpin or a gang leader, not by a long shot. A lot of psychopaths run major multinational companies. Psychopaths they're called are, industrial psychopaths. Yes, yes, exactly. Well, they're they're but they're everywhere. CEOs, yes, they are. pastors of large churches, um, yeah. surgeons, um, heads of all kinds of organizations. They like being in charge because from there they can puppeteer everyone and get their power, profit, and pleasure motivations met. And so they're very good at working systems. And so as a result of that, they're, they're everywhere. And I, I think I tell people, first of all, you, you got to trust those hairs on the back of your neck. They are the best messengers you got. M what many of us do is we wait, they let other people weigh in and say, oh, come on, don't be silly. And, mm, and then that's why they'll push themselves out of their comfort zone. I think we're like cats. You know, we do know if I watch my cat and she's, she'll hear something I don't hear. And then I'll, I'll invariably the fly will buzz into the room at that point. Like she saw that long before I could have sensed it. And I think we all have that little bit of a cat-like mm -hmm. reflex when it comes to these difficult personalities. But I think that a bigger issue, and this is more applicable to narcissism than psychopathy, is that we've, so many of us, and I think women, this has happened to women much more than men, have been socialized to give second chances, to forgive, to, you know, to sort of like, 
give the person the benefit of the doubt. The words benefit of the doubt have done more harm to more people than I care to reflect on. Amen. Cherche, I mean, I have to agree too. I, I think, I think we have conditioned people, kids sometimes to say, Oh, well, they didn't really mean it. Well, yeah, they did. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, yeah. You I, said it, you meant it. He just hit you in the head with a bottle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. He meant it. Yeah. He meant it. And you see this too. And this is a different conversation. Maybe we'll do yeah. it on another time because it'll open an yeah. entirely. I'd uh, love to, by the way. <laughs> So when we see that combination of substance use and narcissism, what will often happen, and law enforcement's very guilty of this, is let him dry out. I'm like, great, let him dry out. He's still a psychologically violent person. He's still gaslighting her. He's still undermining her, still insulting her. Maybe he's not beating her up or breaking a bottle over her head. Maybe that's only reserved for the times when he's intoxicated. But narcissism and substance use and alcohol use go very closely together. Yep. Totally and agree. So that's the other piece that it's very easy to write it off as, oh, this is just drugs and alcohol. Uh, 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 uh. There's very likely a narcissistic underlay. And that is why you see these sorts of revolving door kinds of situations, because the narcissism piece ain't going to shift even when that person becomes sober, if they become sober. Well, and, and California has been always ahead of that curve. I mean, you know, uh, because, you know, to your point, the old days, right? You would just separate them and say, okay, can you go, you know, out for a couple hours, go to a girlfriend's house or vice versa. And then all of a sudden, you know, the legislator said, Hey, time out. Okay. And that's when the DV laws really started getting strict. And, you know, in California, I think it 273.5, if I remember right, but uh, that was the penal code section for domestic violence. And you didn't have a choice. If, if, if mm -hmm. that victim shed, he hit me. Okay. You turn around and say, sir, turn around. You're under arrest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And that was it. And thank goodness that kicked in. And that was the mid eighties, I think early nineties right. when, when those laws started kicking in, but that saved a lot of lives. Uh, to it your did, point. We still have a ways to go. We have a ways to go because I think of that kind of understanding totally of agree. and totally I still agree think that we're missing a lot of these opportunities, but I keep coming back though, to my point is that Yes, we, we could tighten these systems up. We can be better about protective orders. But you already now have a person who's been through trauma when we're talking about domestic violence, right? A person who may have been physically abused, psychologically abused. I'd really like to stop this before it gets to that point. So what we honestly, it is amazing to me the resistance of middle schools and high schools to build in a curriculum to teach both young men and young women to avoid toxic relationships. How hard would that be? No, but people feel like that's too judgy. That's that's a bit much. Is it a bit much? Because if the net result of that is people don't waste years, entire lifetimes in toxic relationships, to me, I don't think there's any other class that could be more important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Romani, if, if I had my wish, it would be to put you on a five-minute bus ride with every person on our channel and yours if you had five minutes to talk to someone who's living in a relationship with a narcissist, what would your counsel be? Five minutes. The first thing I'd ask him was, when was the first time you noticed the red flags? And I'm willing to guess that for most people, it would be somewhere between weeks one and four. Even at, whether this relationship lasted 50 years or 50 days, it would be between weeks one and four. And then I'd say, what happened? How did you talk yourself out of those red flags? because that's exactly the behavior I'd want to have stop. And then in that remaining two minutes I had say, when is the last time you really, really were able to see yourself accurately and remind because remember one of the core struggles in the relationship with the narcissist is the only way you stay in that relationship is because somehow you believe that you are not enough. I'm not enough. If I go out there, I'm going to be alone. I'm not enough. Maybe if I was better, and it would be to break that not enoughness of them. You're more than enough. We were all born more than enough. And so you're more than enough. You're good. Like you're good. Oh, yeah, sorry. All of us don't need to be curing cancer. I'm good. If I'm, fo if I'm following the rules, being kind to people, every so often letting someone go ahead of me in the grocery store, raising my kids, all of that, and, and, and just being kind to other people, I'm more than enough. And I think that that idea of how do I reintroduce a person back to their better instincts. That's what I do in that five minute bus ride. 
Thank wow. you. Chris, what, what would you say to Dr. Romani if you had that five-minute bus ride? Oh, my gosh. I, I'm not going to say anything right now. I just thought that was fantastic, Dr. Romani. I mean, I mean and, you know, thank goodness there, there are Dr. Romani's uh, in this world. We need more Dr. Romani's. Sure. We really do. That's and, my goal. So that's – I'm not going to say another word. I just think this has been a great episode. Thank you. And I absolutely think this is going to be fantastic for – everybody that comes, uh, you know, to hear you uh, and to be educated by you. And, and thank goodness you're saving people's lives. And for that, I'm, I'm grateful that I, we've had a little time with you here today. Very, very, very much like that. That's the only thing I want to say. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. D Dr. Romani, I, I hope you know how much we appreciate now our friendship with you and we hope you'll come back. I will. Let me, let me get through the fall. <laughs> <laughs> with these students and my daughter in high school and all the things I need to get through. And I will definitely, I think these are important conversations to be having across a range of professions and platforms because I am very, very, very sick and tired of watching at the, am the amount of lost human potential I've seen that we have lost to people who are broken by these narcissistic relationships. And my goal is to bring as many people back out of that as I can so they can see the treasures that they are and give back to the world. Because once we once we can unleash that, I actually think we may have a chance at a kinder and more civil world. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank Folks, you. Dr. Romani's contact information to her website, not to her contact information, but no. to her website is listed below. Please go and look and and. Uh, consider picking up her books. I think it could really you. bless your life if you would do so. And we're going to hold her feet to the fire in uh, four or five months when things settle down and try to get her back. And please go and subscribe to her channel please, if you yeah. have not yes, done so please. already. Uh, and, and if you want a great evening out, just go listen to some of her videos and, and your TED Talk, Dr. Yeah. Romani, I thought was one of the most engaging TED Talks I've ever Thank heard. You. So thank you. And thank from, you. from Chris and I, please know you are always welcome on Profiling Evil. And if you hear us saying something goofy, just ring Call our bell and, and we'll have you on the show. <laughs> choir practice is every Monday night. So you're always welcome to come into choir practice. Just hang out with us on the couch. Us out. Thank you. <laughs> so until then, we'll say goodbye to everyone. Bye -bye and thank now. you again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. May. Thank, thank you. you.